Hi everyone. Hi to people facing in person. And hello everyone that's online. Um, I'm Lucia Knight and we it is our the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences new meeting. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see some faces online. Um, we're very happy today that Dr. Jennifer Gathaga is going to talk to us about the Bridges program and reflect on some of the learnings from Bridges. I'm guessing you'll give us some background to, to what Bridges is as well, which will be nice for other people to, to hear about. So Jennifer's going to have about half an hour and then we'll have some time for questions. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. I hope you know how to do all that. I'm uh, assuming you can hear me. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, you, Jennifer, it's, but it's quite soft, is it? I, I don't know if it's just my side. Okay. Um, do I need to talk a little louder? Is that better? That's better. Thanks, yeah. Okay. Let me up my voice. Thanks, Mona. So thank you for attending this presentation. Um, more of virtually and a few here. So I'm glad I'm not talking to an empty room. So thank you for those who have made it to come. And um, I want to tell us something about Bridges. I'll just start with a little bit of background. What is Bridges in the first place? And Bridges stands for Building Research in Interdisciplinary Gender and HIV Through the Social Sciences. And um, this is a five-year um, NIH-funded program. Um, with the principal investigator is um, Associate Professor Christopher James Colvin, or Chris Colvin, as we call him. And um, this program is housed in the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences um, under Lucia Knight. Sorry, Leah, we've got some new technology here we're trying to get used to. And um, so what we do in terms of our focus areas, we have two focus areas, reducing HIV in adolescent girls and young women and improving the performance of men in the HIV um, cascade. And what we want to be, we want to be an exceptional HIV social science research institution. So we are trying to, we are working towards that. It's a work in progress. And our specific aims and what we've been doing is working with a cohort of PhD and postdoctoral uh, research fellows. And um, we've also been trying to offer some courses to fill in gaps in the curriculum, because as you know, um, graduate programs in South Africa, um, PhD programs are not taught, they are research only. So we have offered some more things along the way. And then we also host a Bridges uh, Symposium every year, we've been hosting one. And uh, we have our co cohort of fellows, and then we have a number of fellows we've adopted, affiliate fellows from different divisions and from different departments. So we are very proud that we have a very big family and um, you'll be hearing more about some of our actual work um, itself. So one of the things which is, I think our flagship thing is mentorship in the Bridges program. Not because mentorship is a new thing and you know profound in and of itself, but because we've been very, very deliberate from the get-go about uh, mentorship and um, setting up um, mentoring relationships for our fellows so that they don't just have supervisors. So sometimes we as supervisors traumatize our students with our comments, with our red pen and a lot of you know um, tracking changes. Um, so they need mentors to help them um, along the journey. And that's something we've taken seriously and we've done um, quite a bit on. And the, what I'm going to be talking about the research is an offshoot of that mentorship that has been going on. And um, there are some things about mentorship, like, you know, empowering people and letting them, you know, become a better person. Uh, mentorship is not about making other me people, you know, you want everyone to be the very best um, they can be. So that's one of the things that we've been focusing on. And that's what we feel is a contribution to capacity building. So we are mentored, we mentor others, and it goes on so that we can build capacity um, in South Africa. And I just want to acknowledge uh, some support I received from the Africa Research Excellence Fund group, the RF group, um, Dr. Peter Dukes, who I think retired in 2020 and is now freelancing, and um, Hazel Makala, who helped us. Um, I had some conversations with them and we came up with our bridges model uh, based on what they are doing. Um, these are gurus in mentoring um, from the UK, um, but they were very, they've been very, very, uh, they were very helpful in that process. So I want to talk about the actual study, what we did, reflecting on what our research process was like. The reason why we are special is because this was a COVID cohort and I'm not 
saying it in a very sarcastic way, they had just started their studies in 2020 um, when COVID broke out. So that's why I'm calling um, it's a COVID cohort. And so we have had an unusual experience um, with this particular cohort. And so the specific aims of our study, the one I'm going to report about, which we recently published, was to describe what it is, what it was like, what were our experiences of conducting qualitative research to COVID and to reflect on some of the meaning-making processes and then to highlight lessons learned from the experience. And we hope to contribute to qualitative uh, methods discourse by illuminating the methodological, methodological nuances of qualitative research during COVID in a South African context. There's a lot written, but not too much um, on South Africa. And then we would uh, also want to contribute to qualitative discourse by exemplifying the value of critical reflection in qualitative research practices in the context of postgraduate academic research. So I'm going to tell this as a story because I like telling stories, as many of you know, And um, but I need to frame this story. So it has some theory. There is um, a framework called critical reflection, and it's a postmodernist approach. And four of the theoretical strands are reflective practice in terms of what we do, uh, um, which is let's talk about the things that we don't usually talk about and let's put our assumptions out there. Then reflexivity, um, how, how do we position ourselves and how does this influence the research process? And then there's critical social theory, which focuses on power and power related discourses. You'll see that. And then postmodernism, we are deconstructing thought processes and analyzing the role of language um, in social um, construction of lived experiences. You'll see the, how the story unfolds. Um, so what we did was to superimpose or juxtapose our story in the COVID story, because there were different stages in COVID. Um, you know, there was pre-COVID, then there was, you know, strict lockdown adherence protocols and all of that. So I'll just walk us through the journey. Um, and I hope it won't be too traumatic for you to think about COVID. Um, but <laughs> what I'll be doing is um, also putting in my voice, because what happened is we have our fellows, we had four fellows involved in this project. I was working with them closely as uh, the program manager. We also had a senior academic who is a co-I, um, Dr. Natalie Leon, who was kind of overseeing the process. And so we were reflecting as we were going along the process. So it's a bit of an unusual research process, but I'll talk you through it. So where our journey started was at our first symposium in 2020, March. We are right there, we had our um, co-eyes, um, including some who are in the audience at the moment, others from the US, and we're going on with our business as usual when we heard uh, that COVID was becoming a crisis. And um, at that point, I had just been hired on the job, so this was my third month, and I needed to perform, okay? I don't understand, I'm performance oriented. I needed to impress. And then, um, so I, I thought, you know, I said to the fellows, why don't we record you? Let's do interviews because I know how it is at the start of a PhD process. I'll send them to you as memoirs. One day we'll remember this, you know? And so that's what they were saying, you know, what are their hopes? What do you anticipate are challenges? You know, there may be challenges in South Africa, like violence and protests. Nobody talked about COVID. How do you feel about this PhD? I'm scared, although I'm feeling optimistic. What are some of your fears? I think I'm afraid of getting stuck in my head. We had not finished the week when the COVID thing uh, broke out and we were about to offer a short course in gender theory. And I was calling UCT and, you know, getting calls from CDC, Zambia, are we having this or not? And I'm like, what? And um, we arrived here on Friday and the lockdown was, you know, the university shut down on Monday. So that's how we started with our brand new fellows who are full of hope and shining. Um, and what happened was initially we were very removed from the situation. It was happening, we were like, oh yeah, we hear this COVID out there. And then there was a narrative twist when we realized our co eyes had to scramble, the US embassy was there, get out of there, you'll be stuck. We stopped everything and people scrambled onto flights and got out of here and realized this was something we, that happens to others. You know, it was happening to people in China, it was out there, but it came now to us. And um, so there was a shift in our discourse from then to now. This is something it's going to affect us all. My goodness. 
and it did because we are online from you know uh, forthwith. So people were frantic, and it started now. The reality started hitting, um, and I was thinking, you know, so this little person here at the bottom is, you know, the little, you see that face, it's just, oh my God, you know, um, this might not really be happening. I'm three months into my new job and um, we are ordering, you know, we are being ordered on lockdown. How is this going to work? Um, and do you know this? I don't, I, I looked at this slide today and I shivered because I remember how grave it was that we had to adhere to protocols. Um, this is HF on the other side, this is national, you know, so we were dealing with a lot of um, red tape in terms of adherence to protocols. And our students were just starting their research journey. So what were we going to do about this? What ended up happening is what should have been happening did not happen. People who should have been going to the fields were instead asked to apply for HREC um, amendments to do online research because it is not happening, you're not going to the fields. And um, some of the issues that we expected, now when you go online, um, one of our participants, I mean, one of the, the fellows said, you know, I was sure all people have phones, they all have phones, right? I mean, they all have phones. And then she found out, no, it's not. You give them data, phones are off, it's your auntie's phone, it's, I mean, people don't necessarily have phones. And then she thought, you know, we assume that just um, this person was doing research in a township, just because people are poor, you throw data at them and then they come. They take the data and they switch off the phone. Now, what do you do? You don't have your data and you don't have you don't have your data in terms of both ways, what you're looking for and what you've given. Um, but those were just some of the realities. And from a critical reflection point of view, that was, you know, there was a toppling of procedures, things were upside down, but there were also discourses of power coming up. You're not as powerful as you thought. Mm -hmm. When I come and interview you in person, you sit there and I interview you. Um, but now, the participants are, you know, calling the shots and deciding when is appropriate to be interviewed or not. And um, in my head, I was just wondering, how are these fellows going to cope doing research during the lockdown with such measures? Will we achieve the funders' deliverables? You can be I'm very performance oriented, and you don't joke with an age. That's just what I've learned with time. But how are we going to explain ourselves? Never mind, this was a global problem, but. And then how feasible is it to run a virtual program? I didn't sign up to run a virtual program in Bridges. And you know, I knew that we were gonna be meeting with students and everything was virtual. So those were some of the things I was thinking about. And then now we had to sort of adapt to the new realities. And what we immediately realized is that um, the fellows experiences were not happening in a vacuum. The rest of life was happening, right? You are locked down in your flat, you're staying in a small space, in a cramped space, you know, probably it's co blaming family and or not. Um, they, you know, the, the fellows experiences were interwoven in their personal lives. So it meant making a number of adjustments. And um, one of the um, fellows talked about the considerations of moving to digital methods because of health challenges. So you yourself get ill and your, your health is compromised. So now you are forced to go to digital, you know, after a close shave with illness, you don't want to risk. And um, that thinking about going to a clinic is giving you anxiety. But anyway, you'll be arrested on the way to the clinic. So forget about the anxiety you're facing. There's the law, the long hand of the law waiting for you. And then there was one of the fellows who had a very interesting, as I was reading this story, and just to tell you, you know, as you're reflecting critically, you reflect from your discipline. So a psychologist thinks like a psychologist. And when I read this, I thought, oh my goodness, listen to that metaphor about, you know, mental claustrophobia versus physical, talking about, you know, I was in a small space, I moved to a bigger space, and I did a lot because there was really nothing to do. There was nothing else to do. You know, just seeing that sort of discourse. Um, so these guys were like super productive because we were put in a space and told you can't go. And those guys wrote and defended proposals and are now about to finish, proud to say. And I know some of you in the audience, so well done. You've done quite a good job, a very good job, actually. And then, of course, there's the issue of masks and contact tracing. Goodness. We could write an essay on this on its own. And it was just, yeah, it was very layered because when you're talking about what is behind the masks, I mean, literally, it could be COVID, but also figuratively, what is going on behind the masks? 
and that took a lot of self-reflection. Mm -hmm. So people are reflecting on their change in positionalities because you're not like one thing, you know, one moment you're right, next moment you're freaking out, one moment you're in the field, you're not, you're out of the field. So people are reflecting on what was going on and um, how do they feel about themselves? And this was very interesting in the research situation. For example, now we had to rely a lot on gatekeepers. Usually you go, you know, say hi to the people and then, you know, make your way. Now you are strictly relying on gatekeepers because you are not going to finish yourself. You needed some to rely on somebody. And so this meant that the role of the gatekeeper was very accentuated. They were critical in you doing your, your research, in linking you to participants virtually or whatever. So um, one of our fellows, um, are, you know, a South African, you know, a regular student, black student, um, the gatekeeper was somebody from, was a white person. And she was reflecting on that, you know, I don't know if they would have taken me seriously, even if I'm black. I didn't feel as if, I didn't know if they would have taken me as seriously as they did if I just walked in alone, as opposed to walking in with the gatekeeper, because, you know, the racial context in South Africa. And I remember sitting in that interview and thinking, yeah, I mean, I guess um, I kind of understand. And yes, I'm also a black woman, perhaps not South African, but African. So, you know, that discourse um, I can relate with. And she said, do you know how much respect we assign to whiteness? So I felt having her there was helpful, but not only in terms of her whiteness, but also because they knew her already. You can see there was that sort of tension. It's not just that because of their color, but they are good. They, they, they already have are well placed in the community. So it's actually, no, it's not just about whiteness. At some point she said, no, actually, let me ignore, let's ignore the whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, and then she said, no, actually, there was a white walking in and not have needed her. You know, so you're trying to make sense as you go, it's not like straightforward. You're just trying to think about it. And and then went on to say, you know, um, there's an, an American student who came here, even though she was black, but because of the way she speaks and where she comes from, then she gets the honorary status of whiteness. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was, you know, kind of feeling like I'm treading cautiously because um, I don't know if I have permission to discuss race as an outsider um, in, in, the, in the context. So I was thinking that, you know, this is a very really tentative, cautious mm -hmm. conversation on othering, you know, and uh, meaning making means that you hold tensions and, you know, uh, you acknowledge the politics of assigned status. And it just reminded me, there was a time I was writing a paper on race um, when I was in the free state. And we, there was the concept of pigmentocracy in uh, Brazil, where depending on, you know, if, if you're black, rich, you know, they're doing affluent, you're considered white. Um, if you're poor, white, you're considered black. You know, like, so socioeconomic status and all of that. So it me of, you know, sometimes these things happen and it's very kind of, it's insidious. So that was one um, experience. The other behind the masks experience had to do with a gatekeeper. With a gatekeeper, you go to a context, they assume, oh, you're one of us, you know? So she commented and said, oh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of noise, like when you're doing interviews, as happened, you know, said here actually, but, you know, there's a lot of noise. And um, the gatekeeper said, ah, you, but you know, most, you're also from a township, you know how it is. And she said, I didn't say anything about, about time. I, I didn't say anything because it may come out wrong or it may be received in a wrong way. And I think maybe because you're black, um, people, you know, I, that sort of, you know, I'm an insider because I'm, you know, I'm from this context, I'm black, but not quite. But if I start saying no, I mean, people shouldn't be so noisy. They're not noisy where I live. You're going to create distance. Um, so she chose to remain silent. And I was thinking about the, the assumption of insider statement, uh, you, you know, status by the gatekeeper and expectations. You know, he, you expect, I mean, of course, I expect you to understand you're, you're one of us. And she's like, oh, not quite. But you daren't say it. You need to carry on with your research in a civil style, and you just roll with uh, with the punches. And I think that was part of the fun thing about um, about the study. Um, then we had a chance to look back and talk about, you know, think, reflect on what are the lessons learned, what could we have done differently, what what you know. So fellows meaning making processes included accounts of insights gained from the experiences. And this whole reflection process, it was not like a once-off thing. 
it was something that was going on and what has worked to our in our advantage because i told you or to our advantage uh, that in bridges we are mentorship like as a critical component of our program it means that we continue having these reflections we have a lot of you know we evaluate how we are doing and we keep talking about the processes so it wasn't entirely out of the ordinary when one day we thought oh we should actually we were having our first um real function like not real but in person because yeah after covid and we sat and said, oh, it's been so interesting. Maybe we should write about our experiences. Mm. And that was, you know, at the end of 2020 in December. Then in 2021, at the next symposium, we actually had a meeting and said, you know what, we want to do this. How do we do it? And um, because the critical, you know, critical reflection as a framework, it's a little different because we were all involved in all parts of the meaning making process. So even negotiating and said, you know, um, we yeah. thought about some questions and our experiences and there was a lot of brainstorming and um, even if like I ended up doing the interviews, um, they were pretty, you know, these are the kind of questions we are looking at. This is what, you know, you're supposed to be thinking about ahead of time. So it wasn't really your typical uh, regular research uh, process. And I'm mentioning that because um, we submitted our paper and it was it was published um, by a journal of the University of Alberta and they're very big on qualitative research and they gave us a run for our money with ethics and they said did you apply for ethics and we said no we did not need to apply for ethics because you know this is a co-constructed process we've not mentioned anything outside of the researcher's experience we are researching on ourselves we followed the protocols We've uh, looked at how critical reflection as a framework. We are reporting on something that is ongoing as part of our program. And we got through, and our paper was published this year, you know, in January, after a couple of months. Um, but we had to show how, you know, methods matter. You don't just get away doing what you want. And they said, you know, what about the people? We said the the fellows even vetted. They, they read through all the things and said, you know what? I don't like this. Take this out. Uh, I've actually changed my mind. Remove that. And if we put this... Uh, um, identities will be compromised, take that out. Let's arrange, you know, so they were fully immersed in the process. So it was a fully co-constructed process. And that's why I keep talking about we, 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 because it was, we did it as, as a group. And so when people were reflecting on the whole, you know, their research experiences, um, one of the fellows said, so I think I've learned about research processes. And, you know, this whole idea of you need to remember that you need to be flexible and research is unpredictable. It was already unpredictable before COVID, but mm -hmm. times 10 to power six because of COVID. Um, and you must be willing to make changes. Um, it just unfolded in a very different way for all of us in the field. So we read about it. Okay, we read about it. We learn about it. We were told about it. We experienced it, but we still could not predict what would have happened during COVID-19, we are still affected by it. And that was quite a dramatic change. So I've learned about control and acceptance in a way. Sometimes things happen that you don't expect and sometimes in a really extreme way. And we've learned about that now and to have some form of acceptance and being gentle with yourselves. It was hard to be doing research, to be consulting virtually. Um, we also struggled. And I'll tell you about my struggles as uh, in the position of a supervisor, for example. But the students struggles to just get their feet on the ground and keep going. And then um, also began to appreciate at the end of it, like Zumba says, I may not have gone for that, like virtual interviews. She was like, you know, this was not my, you know, probably my first choice. Um, but that would have robbed me of an opportunity to actually get more interviews. Because when we kind of warmed up to it, well, HREC made us warm up to it because you either stopped doing research or you did virtual research. People realized that there are new ways um, of doing things. And what I struggled with was um, I'm old school, okay? And I'm not apologetic. You know, I'm old, I'm an old researcher. I know that, you know, the gold standard for qualitative research is pass on to, I need to see you and be talking to you. So um, I still found myself fronting my agenda and saying that, um, you know, proper, proper interviews, that's, you know, that's the gold standard, the real thing. Then if all else fails, 
put plan B, put it as plan B. And I remember telling my, one of my students, when you're submitting to ethics, put this as plan B, the virtual research approaches, put it down there. But let's try and see if we can do this research. And I was still trying to fight and I was like, if it's HIV related research, you may get away. Because a part of me was not comfortable with that. And the students are dot com. They are savvy, technologically very savvy, astute. They knew what to do. And so what happened was also a turn of power hierarchies. The students became the teachers. They taught us. We said, OK, come and present to us. Tell us what you're planning to do. I need to take notes because I don't know what this, you know, this is the new thing for me. So they taught us. We learned. So, you know, that's also a talking of power hierarchies, which was something very interesting. And they said, no, we have to do this. Okay, so what, how do those WhatsApp diaries work? How are we going to do this, you know? And they've done it and they did it. And now we can see, you know, beautiful work in the offing. But we had to take a step back and be also willing to learn and not think that, you know, we are the academics, we know everything. And I thought, you know, I may claim to have some experience with qualitative research, but you put the word virtual there, I'm back to grade one. And I went back to grade one in the land, and I'm still learning. And what the interesting thing was at the end of the day is <laughs> for me, the most, you know, my moment of triumph was in 2020, I thought, you know, let's save these memoirs. And, you know, maybe one day people will tell their story. We need to tell our story and we got to write about it and it was published. So, you know, it's out there and we have something to share about, um, you know, atypical experiences of um, research um, during COVID. And I'm not saying that our study was perfect. No, no, we are not claiming. Sorry, I'm just issuing a disclaimer right there. Um, there were some strengths, there were some limitations. And as you know, when you do qualitative research, you cannot make claims for, you cannot generalize. And now say, you know, it was a very nuanced study and on, in fact, a very small cohort of students. So the idea of, you know, findings being generalizable, that was never even our aim. We wanted to tell our story. So at least we succeeded in telling our story. Um, and also just in a systematic way, the systematic unpacking of lived experiences using critical um, reflection as a lens. And um, it also, this study, one of the strengths was, is that it illustrates the role of participants as co-constructors of knowledge. And, you know, we had such different viewpoints. You know, you hear the same thing and everyone is thinking differently about it. So it was really a chance to see um, the strength that people have and what they bring um, into a research experience. So we feel that because we, you know, have a paper trail and kept, you know, we're trying to be accountable in our process that, and gave as much, as rich descriptions as possible, then that could potentially, um, somebody could use that information to determine if um, they will, you know, to what degree or to what level is there, you know, might some of the things and some of the lessons be transferable in similar contexts. But we are not trying to generalize or, you know, or boast about anything. Um, so, so that's our story. And where are we at now? We have um, one graduate, one kind of graduated in the, the last graduation. We have two who are here. I'm saying here because, you know, we have read drafts of full dissertations. And we are being chased to the finish line. They are now. We've changed, you know, roles have changed. We usually push them and now they are taking our hand and we are, we are finishing this thing. So we, we have two that are almost there and another two that are close behind and one who has, um, sub, who's just almost about done. And then we have, uh, we have one postdoctoral fellow who finished with us and uh, moved to do another postdoc. And we have another postdoctoral fellow um, we have 11 affiliate fellows um, who we are very proud to be associated with from different um, episodes, uh, um our division, even within the division of DSBS, but not particularly Bridges. Upper campus, we even have someone. We have students who are ex-students from here, um, like one in Cambridge, but, you know, ex and PhD students. So what we are saying and what we have done and are continuing to do is to keep an open space and to invite people. So if you have PhDs who don't have a family, then you know, we are the adoption group. <laughs> Bridges, we call people adopted fellows and affiliate fellows is actually a kind of word, which is what we prefer to use. Um, but just being able to share if we have symposiums, uh, we fund it and get have had people attend. We um, run five courses 
and we've invited different people to attend from different institutions. At some point, we felt inspired and we applied for a supplement grant to help us share grant writing experiences with um, students with early career and PhDs from historically disadvantaged institutions. We got the supplement and we trained um, a cohort of, of uh, early career people from uh, different universities around and also some from UCT from historically disadvantaged groups. And um, so it's been a pleasure being part of this process because I have also been a receiver of mentorship. It's not um, when I started working, I didn't know anything about grants writing. And so I learned um, from um, Chris Colvin and he teaches by you know example. He said, are you ready to do this? I said, yes. Do you know what an R21 is? Yes. You know, I mean, it's like, let's apply, let's do this. And so I've learned, and then we are, and we are trying to share the, our skills because at the end of the day, we've realized that for um, researchers, if you want, if you want research, researchers to grow and develop in South Africa, especially the early career group, you need to be able to become an independent researcher and raise your own funding um, to maintain yourself in, in research. And I'm talking to myself because I'm in that same situation myself. But this is something then that we can share and we hope to continue offering um, like training and grant writing, sharing what we know. So we share the little um, resources we have. And um, so I'll just finish now with um, just an acknowledgement. I'm not sure if Chris is on this call because he killed me and he gets publicity, but I'm sorry, Chris. Um, we are very thankful. Chris has been a very good um, uh, mentor to very many people over a number of years and a number of you know Chris Colvin. And um, so we are very grateful um, to Chris for his mentorship and for leading by example. Chris likes to lead from behind. He's quiet, no one sees him. That's why I put his photo there. Chris, if you're here, you're gonna kill me, but just for today, people need to know who you are. And just for what that kind of mentorship means for developing um, capacity among you know, postgraduate scholarship, we've got what it takes. We just need to be nurtured. We need a nurturing environment um, to keep going. And that's what we do. Um, in uh, DSBS and um, in Bridges as well. And so just a big thank you to the participants. And I just said, go Bridges. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who have been involved in this and the publication is there if anyone wants to read it, it's you know available. Um, but I'll stop talking there and thank you very much. Don't sit down. everyone. Um, let's have some questions. We can start in the room. Are there any questions or comments in the room? And for those of you that are online, if you have questions, you can pop your hand up. Sue. That was so amazing and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. It was really a stunning presentation. My question is, um, if you could provide us with more detail about um, your mentorship model, the structure of it, individual frequency learning, uh, something I'm interested in as well. And so I think it's important to learn from it and to take it forward. Shall we answer that now? Yeah. So um, we have um, a sort of a mentorship model where you have mentors who are different than your supervisors. And what we did at the start of the program is get input from fellows input from our co-investigators, some of who are on this call and are, have been mentoring our students, mm -hmm. and ask them to see, you know, to decide what, what they feel, who, you know, what are their needs, first of all. So we did some sort of needs assessment, you know, what do you feel you need? And you know, as you know, that changes along the way, and um, who might you want to work with? And so we paired them up, or, you know, if somebody wanted to have more than one mentor, that's been fine, because different mentors with different things. And then they decide on the frequency of the meetings. And initially it was quite frequent, um, you know, um, depending on what they agreed. And we didn't interfere with the, in terms of the content. We just checked in because we have uh, regular check-in meetings. And twice a year we have evaluations and we say, you know, how is it going with the mentoring? Are you still okay? Do you feel you need now a different mentor? Where are you at? And that sort of thing. And then um, they've also had, we've also had a chance now to implement some of what the needs are 
oh, I need some lecturing experience. And we say, okay, come and lecture. I need some supervision experience. So like I'm co-supervising a master's student with one of my PhD students, mm -hmm. so they can learn how to do it. Um, and then sometimes, you know, the fellows will prepare presentations, like if they're lecturing, and we'll have a look and say, ah, you can't, you can't have 300 slides for, you know. I mean, if it doesn't happen, I'm just, that's just a joke. <laughs> but, um, you know, just kind of coaching in that type of sense. So that's how it's um, it's kind of worked. And then we have a team of co-eyes who are open to having mentorship experiences. Five of our fellows are just about to go to Brown University for a three week mini sabbatical in Providence. Nice. And they have mentors. So we've attached them to mentors. They've sent work ahead. They've said, this is what I want to be working on. So it's that sort of thing. So we've had input from our collaborators at Brown University as well as the UCT team. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was amazing. Uh, quick one. Um, do you think that? Oh, sorry, serious. Do you think that uh, research could possibly move towards um, having a virtual sort of um, field work? As as the first option, given given the experiences that you know, what had with, with COVID, and how do you think that could probably alter the landscape for participants who may feel a measure of, like you said, um, power or presence in terms of the co-creation process? Because I imagine that 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 is the intention of research, right, to become yes. a melting pot for co-creation. Yeah. So, do you think that could possibly become? Um, uh, a preferred way of engaging participants, despite the gold standard. Uh, well, yes. So let me say that um, it it did it did prove to work, and it is proving to work. Um, not uh, uh, seamlessly. I mean, of course, there are challenges. Um, but there were two things that were raised. I just couldn't get to them, but uh, it's in the paper itself. That there were two angles to that. There was empowering of participants who now become stakeholders and choose mm. when you interview them, my terms, my time. Um, so that was one end of the thing. And of course, the loss of power from the, <laughs> the, the, part, the interviewers side and that sort of thing. But there was also the imaginary screen yeah. that is brought up by having the technological screen. Because I can see you, I can read your body language, I can see if you're shaking your leg, but when you're like, let's do a WhatsApp audio call. I don't know if you're sniggering at me. I don't know what's happening. So there's something that could be lost yeah. in terms of the nonverbal, yeah. you know, call it paralanguage mm. that could be compromised. Yeah. Mm. Nisha, do you want to ask your question? Are you there, Nisha? Um, I don't know if Nisha is where I'm logged on. <laughs> Oh, Leslie, yeah. yes, you're locked on as Nisha. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> uh, we're, in the we're with the registrars in the boardroom at HU okay. because we didn't have time to come across. Uh, <laughs> that's me. So thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, uh, really interesting talk. I, I, I was really struck by the fact that um, you spoke about COVID as being a period of opportunities in a way, and because it reframes how things Worked. And that was partly our experience. It was hard, but it was also opportunities. I wonder if you, you think that it's changed the way you think about research ethics now. Um, um, experience. Yes, certainly. You know, some of us were kicked, you know, it was kicking and screaming. And I'm like, why are they doing this to us? But um, in terms of ethics, I think we are actually, it calls for a higher standard of ethics mm. because intrude in people's private spaces you could there's a lot of things that could be breached that you cannot do in a clinic setup or in an open setup but you can do it in your own you know in your own uh, uh private space so there is a higher sort of call for you know personal um integrity and uh, accountability in reporting on on research that's my short answer to to that question but we could have a whole day debate obviously on this Okay, I'll put up Nisha's hand again if anybody in the room here wants to ask another question. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, Leslie. Um, Carla, you're up next. Great, thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Absolutely love hearing about that. Um, my question is, so, you know, COVID was a specific moment, and as you've said, there were these, it, it provided these opportunities that were unexpected. Um, 
But more broadly than that, what do you think the process of doing this critical reflection, engaging critically with the research process and researchers themselves from a more kind of holistic psychological perspective, what lessons do you think can be learned from this that could be applied in all contexts, so not just epidemic-driven you know, crises context, like were there things that you thought, okay, yes, COVID shaped certain dynamics of this, but actually, you know, or are you thinking about looking at that in a cohort that isn't a COVID cohort? Yes, thanks. absolutely. And uh, thanks, um, Carla. Beyond um, um, COVID, I think one of the things that, the, you know, critical reflection as a framework is great for people who work in any kind of research because of the sort of monitoring and evaluation process, we usually have a very um, dichotomous way of thinking that we are doing the project and then we are monitoring and evaluating thereafter. Mm. But this should be a continuous process and uh, we should be able to learn and grow from the experiences. So I think not even just for a COVID cohort, for a research <laughs> and, um, you know, just in general, this is an opportunity for us to be more um, deliberate about our processes. We take a lot of things for granted. We, um, you know, push a lot of things under the carpet. Uh, we were forced to, you know, declare explicit the implicit, and mm. that should be part of the accountability we are talking about in terms of integrity in research practice. So I think there are lessons to learn um, going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Mona, you've got your hand up. Um, well, well, first of all, really a huge congratulations, Jennifer, to you and your co-authors. I find this really fascinating. You know, obviously my own background is quantitative and we don't spend much time reflecting on, you know, our position, on this, all of the stuff that you've talked about. And I find it absolutely fascinating. I think that your presentation, I think that the, the work is really refreshing. It's honest. It's insightful. And it really um, shows very clearly how what started out as being an incredible challenge to anybody who was planning to do qualitative research. I think it was devastating. Beginning of COVID, people were absolutely devastated. Those, who, particularly those who were just embarking on their on their PhDs. Um, and so to see how through this process this has been turned around and has actually been turned into, you know, an opportunity as much as it could be, it's it's remarkable. And I think the whole the the the, the point about the flexibility being able to actually understand the way that you do research a bit differently is, is amazing. And the fact that you have not taken this, reflected on it, and you are sharing, again, I think this is a part of research dissemination we don't hear much about. Um, and I really find it absolutely fascinating. So congratulations to you all. Thank you. And thank you, Mona. Mona is one of our co-ids who has been, she's like a mom to all of us. She um, <laughs> has taken us under her wing, so we are on the side as we, and we really appreciate you, Mona. Thank you so much. She's been involved right from the beginning, from that, you know, COVID time and, and even before and, you know, and, and now. So we really enjoyed that support. So we are very grateful uh, for your input. And it's been nice to have uh, one of the other things we've learned is the interdisciplinary space. Yeah. It's a beautiful space uh, because we have people from different backgrounds, poor, poor, you know, happy, health system, wherever, coming from different, you know, nutritional happy you know, completely different fields coming together and forming a caucus where we can learn from each other. So thanks, Mona, and uh, it's really nice learning. It's, it's such a pleasure uh, learning from uh, new people as well. You've actually made me endeared me to EPI. I've been doing EPI courses and guys are asking me if I'm in EPI. Um, just to say, I'm in the Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences, <laughs> passionate about EPI and health systems and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Are there any other questions, follow-up? I'll make a comment. Yeah. So as an affiliate fellow, yeah. I think just to thank you and the Bridges team for creating that space. I don't think we say this enough, but it's been really a, a very conducive space to find oneself, to learn. I mean, I've learned a lot from all of the Bridges fellows. Mm -hmm. I have um, gotten a lot in terms of feedback, one-on-ones. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've what you've done with that space and what you've opened that space up to be for for affiliate fellows has been very very sort of you know healthy rewarding and and beneficial to people who normally be 
or from sticking out like an old mm -hmm. school but yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that also comes through in the interactions in terms of how just this particular cohort of fellows have embraced and run with with the mm -hmm. with the with the with the, with the alchemy, the process of mm -hmm. alchemy that they found themselves in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, no, thanks for that. It's been great. Thanks, Landa. We're glad to have um, uh, your feedback as an affiliate fellow and um, the others who are um, sitting in uh, in the meeting even virtually. It's uh, it's a real, real pleasure interacting with some of you. I can see Loazi there and others. Um, thank you so much for attending and for supporting us. And we hope we can continue to work together. And there might be some PhD students here who are feeling they would like to be part of this. Please talk to us, send me an email. And I literally mean that, no protocols. So we know that sadly Bridget has a period of time that will come to an end, but I know you guys are applying for more for mm -hmm. carry on. Can you briefly tell us what that one's going to be about, either of you? Sure. Okay, I think uh, my. <laughs> so yeah, I mean we've really enjoyed learning from Bridges and reflecting on that experience and. And what so what we're doing is we're proposing a follow-on that will take it from focus on PhD fellows, which is what Bridges has been, um, to a focus on postdocs and developing postdocs. So although Bridges has two postdocs that are affiliated and have been through the course, the, the focus has really been on the PhD students and the training of PhDs. Mm -hmm. And so what the new um, the new grant will look at will we'll be continuing the work in the space of social science and, and HIV, but shifting a little bit towards a greater focus on implementation science because we're it's a space that we're working on already in terms of the, the division and also with a slight focus on developing our behavioral science because that's one of the things that we haven't done a huge amount of as a division and so kind of building on this amazing foundation that is bridges to to develop postdocs so it'll be a smaller program but we hope that through those postdocs we will still be able to continue some sort of development and inclusion of people outside of just those two or three fellows. And so we're going to continue the the really, I think one of the key things, and I think it, it talks to London's experience, has been this opportunity to come together in a protected time and space around the symposia, which I've been super, super grateful and um, to, to also be able to be part of. And I think that kind of protected space within a, um, time and space within a conducive environment to be able to share both with fellows who are colleagues and kind of at the same level, but also with invited, you know, co eyes people who are linked to the project and us more broadly outside to be able to have a learning space um, is really, really valuable. And so that's one of the things that we're going to continue throughout. And so we really hope to be able to kind of continue the reach a little bit, I guess, in terms of what we've already done with Bridges. So we're hoping that some of the Bridges fellows maybe can be our, or affiliates can be our new postdoc um, fellows. For, uh, well, well, if we get the grant, we've submitted, so that's where we're at. Yeah. So it's it's um, early career. Yeah, high plan. So, so Bridges kind of came out of SASH, which I don't know if you remember, and SASH was not something I was involved in, but was essentially around a master's development program. And so what we're pitching it as is a sort of continuation through the the pipeline, but also as each new grant is kind of developing something a little bit different in terms of a new level. So, yeah. It reminds me that the master card also has early career yeah. development in it, and it would be great to yeah. join these things up and sort of... Yeah. Massify, yeah. <laughs> want to better work, yeah. um, to think about it at the level of school. And so, Sue, it would be wonderful to continue that conversation and we could share what we're proposing with you and kind of think about. I, I guess one of the things is also that we're trying to expand in terms of our focus, and already the, the Bridges is very multidisciplinary in terms of who's part of the team, but the way that it was written was quite focused around social science and HIV, and what we're trying to do is to expand that a little more and thinking around, you know, quantitative methods within social and behavioral sciences, for example, and, you know, the behavioral science focus, which is not an area of great expertise, and kind of pulling those things, which I think talk to also some of the things around and um, the MasterCard Foundation focus. So yeah, it would be it would be great, and we're we're excited and happy to to share our um, 
ideas and, and think about ways to look for intersections. So now I've taken Jennifer's time. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other follow-up questions from anyone else who's online? Do you have anything else you want to add, Jennifer? Well, thank you very much for your audience. It's <laughs> lovely to talk about something that you yeah. believe in and that you're passionate about. So thank you for listening. I was hoping I was not going to be talking to desks and chairs, so I'm so <laughs> glad that you know people attended. And um, thank you very much. Let's keep supporting each other. Yeah. And um, yeah, mentorship for capacity building is our take home message yeah. for how we're going to develop capacity here in South Africa mm -hmm. for researchers. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you for attending. Have a lovely afternoon.